One of the things that became clear as we uh, called over the notes from the morning is that one of the challenges we're dealing with here is a blurring of a lot of lines. The line between what is personal uh, bullying and harassment versus online and what about the physical uh, issues and the whole issue which just came up a few minutes ago about what, what is the campus and where do the limits of the campus extend? What about the blurring of lines between the freedom of expression and what is harassment? And what's the continuum? Where and how does one impact the other? We've heard a lot about policy and legality issues as well and, and uh, questions about when is it that the criminal law can best play a role here? And um, my perception on this one is that when it comes to policy and legalities, a lot of people wonder uh, why, you know, people like myself and, you know, those of us who are kind of policy wonks in the room, why, why is it so important? And it's important because if we don't have policy, we don't have a basis to act. And that's a very important issue. If we, when we have a policy vacuum and we have an act, a, a lack of action, then we make ourselves vulnerable, not only do we make the individuals more vulnerable, but we make our institutions more vulnerable, both to reputational damage, but also to damage to individuals and potentially uh, civil uh, problems down the road. Other blurrings are around perception and uh, reality. When uh, the West Vancouver example might be something that could be brought up, and the perception of some people, the West Vancouver police situation is one individual's perception of their being harassed is is not necessarily the reality as it's seen by someone else's, in someone else's, through someone else's lens, if you will. And then issues of relationships, obviously, are important. And uh, in an era, era of technology, what does it actually mean to have uh, an online relationship? And, and how do we create those civil relationships online? Uh, fear and underreporting came up quite a lot as well, and issues of uh, reporting and fear of retribution. I won't uh, talk about the legal issues, we've talked a lot uh, about that. How do we create cultures of accountability and responsibility came up for a lot of people as well. We noticed this on almost all the sheets. What's the, what's the culture issue? Not only what is the policy issue, but what is the culture? What is it that we're trying to create? How can we use policy to change behaviors and what are the behaviors we're looking like? A lot of people also talked about issues of entitlement. And I would suggest perhaps this comes back to that bigger issue we talked about this morning around privilege uh, that uh, is a reality in the university environment. How do we equip ourselves and how do we equip the people that are part of our university community to have the skills to be able to respond to these issues? We heard some talk this afternoon about how restorative justice and mediation and those sorts of things might, be, uh, m m might play a role, but how might we use those? And the really big question about willingness, and uh, some groups brought up the question of, so it's out there, but what's the will? Is the will there in the university to actually make it different? Is there will there in the university, and, and who has the power to really make it different, and how do we do that in ways which are inclusive? And another one that's come up several times today is, it's still not clear what we're talking about to many people. What does cyberbullying actually mean? And what does it mean to be a bystander? That term has come up a lot. What does it mean to be a bystander in the, in the cyber world? We know what it means to be a bystander when we talk about physical or person-to-person -person bullying, but what does it mean in the cyber bullying, in the cyber world? Is it different? How is it different? And, and how do we create expectations that the bystander, those, those individuals who have an awareness but aren't acting, need to act? And, and how, how should those bystanders act is really still not clear. When people talked about uh, the definition, we're still not clear exactly what it means. How is it different from bullying, for example? And then in the afternoon, a lot of similar issues came up. And again, this whole notion of policy and process, it's coming up over and over and over. And we need to wrestle with this. We need to determine what those policies are. What are those support systems? How do we determine when it comes to cyberbullying who really is the most vulnerable? Who's the most at risk? It was pretty clear from our morning presentations that this is a gendered issue. And uh, so therefore, how do we respond? How do we determine who is the most vulnerable? We know from the early data, it appears women are more vulnerable than are men. But what more do we need to know about that? What do we need to know? Who are the women that are most vulnerable? 
is there an issue of power, and to what degree is power or powerlessness um, an issue in terms of creating vulnerability? When we respond, how do we take an educative response as opposed to a disciplinary response? How do we change behavior in proactive ways and not have to punish people or believe we have to punish people into different behaviors? And then finally, resources. What do we do around resourcing this issue and helping people uh, to get help? And what about faculty? It's clear that a number of faculty, uh, female faculty members, feel vulnerable on this issue. And, and how do they get support? And how does a faculty person, especially if they're a new faculty person and uh, you know, they're on tenure track or they're early on in their academic career, perhaps they're not even on tenure track, but they would like to be on tenure track and they're in, a, they're in a lecturer position, but they're hoping to build their career and they need to take significant steps. How do they actually act to do that in ways which don't harm their career potential? And then finally, uh, several groups picked up on the issue that we heard this afternoon as well about digital citizenship and, and how do we do that and, and what do the information and awareness campaigns? So, so a lot of themes came up and what we're hoping is that we would like, we'll do our best to you know, move forward. We're going to try to create this type of vehicle and other vehicles uh, to move this issue forward. And as we wrestle with and we develop solutions at the institutions that are here and across Canada that we have. But what we haven't really done in the university is, is really picked up on that and, and asked ourselves some really key questions about what does social responsibility and citizenship mean in the university environment. We make these assumptions that it will just take care of itself. Well, the university is inheriting uh, students who have come from 12 years in which there's a culture and a language and there's a very definite um, emphasis on the building of culture and the responsibility of every child. Then they, come in t then they come to our universities and those conversations stop and we parse all the conversations off into these different subject matters and I think one of the things that we really need to wrestle with is this whole issue of what does it mean to build a sense of social responsibility? What does it mean to build a sense of community? What does it really mean to be a caring place uh, in the university? I think, in my perception, is the great challenge for us in the next era, going forward and building uh, even greater.